This is Privateer's E161. And Privateer say that every single decision that they've made on this bike has been for performance reasons alone. The creation of the E161 was fueled by the desires of Privateer EWS riders. And Privateer say the E161 has been built to serve as the ultimate training tool for Enduro World Cup riders. It's designed around the Privateer 161, which is the highly acclaimed pedal enduro bike. But now it's got an 85 Nm Shimano EP801 motor and a 630 watt hour removable battery. The E161 comes with 161mm of rear wheel travel, a 170mm fork and a mixed wheel size. And it's complemented with enduro based geometry and size-specific chainstays. The build spec is laser-focused on prioritising performance. They've tried to offer the best value e-bike possible with the best performing parts to build a bike that's priced at 4999 So the goal, killer value for money. And they've tried to do this by reducing the unnecessary components that offer little to no performance gains and spend and invest where it will tangibly enhance the ride, not just where it adds aesthetics. So things like the fork and the shock, they're not the bling gold Kashima coated, but they're the same internals, so you'll get exactly the same performance levels out of them. And that means that as a rider, you pay less for the bike, but you get more in terms of the actual performance for your money. And Privateer know that riders change bars and stem length for their own personal preference. They've just put a base level bar and stem and grips because they know that riders that choose this bike are likely to change things like that. So they've not invested heavily on branded things there. But all of the key decisions have been put into the actual performance of the bike, the geometry, the suspension design, and Privateer say it's been designed for longevity as well. It's got a beefy design, a burly design. It's got a big forged bash plate underneath here. And they say it can take an absolute beating. You can ride it all winter, put it in the shed for a few weeks, come out, don't even clean it and just get on it and start riding it right away. So every decision that they've made has been based on outright enduro performance. The first thing I noticed was the bike felt much, much lighter than the numbers suggest on paper. Now my bike weighs 26 kilos, but I'd have never have guessed it because it rides way lighter than the numbers suggest. And on the first few trails, I was immediately drawn to how the bike soaked up all of the small chatter from the trails. That is a direct result of the excellent choice of the Fox Performance Elite suspension, as well as its suspension leverage curve. It seemed pretty eager to use its first half of the travel quite easily, but it resulted in incredible levels of grip. Through these Maxxis Max Grip downhill tyres, they seem to be able to grip in just about to every single millimetre of the trail. And in fact, I'd say that the extra weight of the bike actually helps it feel glued to the floor and really stable on some of the rough descents. They really have fine-tuned this suspension performance of this bike. The Performance Elite fork paired with the shock. On these chattery enduro trails with, they're fairly steep, but there's lots of bits of roots like chunky roots and stuff that you can just flutter over. And the balance between the front and rear feels great for me. So the chainstay length is proportioned to each bike size. So I feel like I've got a really good balance on this bike between the front and the rear. And it feels really planted in the corners and it feels like I can push the front into the corner, get the tire to bite in, allow the suspension to flutter over it. So the rear suspension has loads of sensitivity just off the top and it's like very fluttery the rear wheel I can feel just tracking over the bumps and as a rider the platform feels really stable and really balanced. The chainstay on my bike measured 456 millimeters and when it comes to climbing longer chainstays mean that I feel the bike is way more balanced on the steep stuff. I'm much preferring this length of chainstays on e-bikes. The longer rear centers just make a lot of sense to me 
When the bikes are able to climb up super steep stuff that you'd never attempt on a regular pedal bike, the longer chainstay maximizes the amount of grip on the rear wheel and keeps the front wheel from lifting. So the geometry of the bike really lends itself to climbing. It's got a steep seat tube angle, 79 degrees actually. So what that means to my rider weight is as I'm sat perched on the saddle, my weight is quite central on the bike rather than being slack and over the rear wheel. And what that means is as I approach steeper sections, there's loads of weight on the front wheel. So there's less tendency for the front wheel to lift up on climbs. I feel nice and planted, nice and central. And because this bike has size specific chain stays, it means that each bike feels balanced. What tends to happen with different frame sizes is the manufacturers just increase the front triangles of the bikes. And if you're a taller rider, that means your balance point is different on an extra large bike compared to a small bike, for example. So size specific chain stays means the bikes ride very similar across the range of frame sizes. So this feels really well balanced for me on climbs. I feel very, very central on the bike. I've got that slightly longer size specific chain stay. So I can be confident that as soon as I start putting the power down and getting steeper on climbs, I'm not gonna get a super light front end. So it's nice and planted. I feel very, very central. I feel like I don't need to weight the front. I just feel like I'm in a position on the bike that's comfortable and I can just look at the lines that I need to take rather than trying to use excessive body language to actually weight the front wheel. There's not a huge amount of brands that have steep seat tube angles like this, 79 degrees. They're getting there. Privateer actually started with an 80 degree seat tube angle on some of their test mules, but they found that a little bit too steep. I've used 80 degrees before and I found them okay, but a 79 degree is probably a really nice sweet spot. So steep seat tube angle, size specific chain stay, and geometry that really lends itself to climbing. The Shimano motor, has a lot of startup power. It does lack some of the punch at higher cadences I found, but at low cadences, it has a decent linear amount of power that it supplies you as a rider. So it's very, very predictable. There's not a huge amount of overrun, if, if any, a very small amount of overrun. So it's not surging you forward after you've finished pedaling and it's quick to pick up again. It's very quick, it engages really quick on the pedals. So as a climbing bike, this is a really effective climber, loses some of the punch at the real higher cadences. And um, after you've hit maybe a rock and you're trying to give it another stab of power, it doesn't give me quite the same instant power as some of the other motors on the market, but it's definitely an effective climber. And at lower cadences, you get a decent power output from this Shimano EP801 motor. I found the real strength in the bike was the ability to winch to the top and plummet back down, which arguably many e-bikes are good for, but the level of the suspension performance on this bike, with its well-sorted, balanced and planted feel in geometry, and a measured 63.5 degree head angle, with high levels of grip provided by the chassis and the component spec, meant that I felt that this is where the bike really does shine. So I think for the price, you're getting a lot of bike for the money. It's a very sensibly specced bike. They've spent money where it actually is worth spending it on things like the suspension and things that riders often change, like the bars, the grips, all of those touch points are the kind of more budget end, which helps bring the overall price down. But I do end up swapping out most of the bars and the grips and those things. So I'm fine with like no brand cheaper end there. But if you can nail the suspension performance out of the box, then that's a massive cost saving down the line. It's basically running the top level suspension you can get on the market. And that's brilliant on a bike at 4999. So I'll cover some things I'd like to see improve for a future version. The bike is heavy, but 
I only notice it really when I'm moving the bike around, getting on and off my car rack and picking it up in my garage because it rides really light. But there's no getting away from the fact it is a 26 kilo e-bike in my stand, in my scales, in this uh, a P3 size here. So it's a heavy e-bike at 26 kilos, but when you ride it, that weight does disappear. I would have never have guessed that this is a 26 kilo e-bike from the way it rides at all, but it's definitely a consideration for a lot of people. And the 26 kilo weight might put some people off as might the 630 battery if you're somebody that prefers to do long rides or just use um, boost a little bit more. So Brands are bringing out bikes with 700 and 750 batteries. This has got a 630. It is easy to remove though. It's very, very quick and easy to remove. So if you wanted to double up on batteries, you're gonna get double the range or double the length, but it is a little bit more hassle having two batteries rather than one big one. Now, the other thing is it's quite busy with cables and stuff. I could probably neaten up a little bit with cable ties and things. They're the only downsides on this bike. I think it rides superb. It is incredibly planted and incredibly stable. And it feels to me like there's near limitless grip, both out the front and the rear. And I'm a massive fan of the geometry on this bike. I like the balanced feeling that I get with the longer rear center in proportion to the front center. And as a rider said in the video, I feel very, very balanced on the bike and the geometry really lends itself going down. I think this bike is suited to somebody that just wants to winch to the top and smash it back down. And that is where the strength in this bike is. It is exquisite in its handling. It is superbly sensitive. The suspension feels quite linear to me and I actually don't mind that at all. I think it's very, very supple off the top and it's easy to use all of that suspension travel. And ultimately that transfers to a lot of grip. And when you've got some sticky rubber like this Max Grip Asagai and DHR2 in downhill casing, it's a really fun and incredibly capable machine to hit in as much chunk as you dare. I also found the EPA01 pretty decent. Now, although that rattle noise is there, I can't notice it anywhere near as much as the previous gen EP8s. This bike actually felt louder to me going uphill than it did going down. I certainly noticed the motor noise going up more than the rattle going down, which is definitely different to the uh, prior generation. I felt that that going up was quiet and very rattly going down. But actually I couldn't notice much noise at all. I wasn't conscious of any rattling going down. It is there, I'm sure if you listen to it in the video, you can hear it, but certainly wasn't an, any bother to me at all. So beast of an enduro bike, really. A bike for smashing it down as hard as you can. And actually I really like the aesthetic of the bike. I think it looks super cool in this raw aluminium. The build looks burly. It looks like it means business. And actually it really does. If you like, smashing it up the top as quick as you can and just plowing through and just hitting as much chunk as you dare, then this is a massively capable bike. So thanks for watching. I hope you liked the video. Let me know any comments or feedback below and I'll catch you soon.